Now, um, I was raised a little bit Pentecostal, so if you don't shout, you make me nervous. I'll preach to the side of the room that shouts the loudest. <laughs> I like this group. Um, I just want to welcome just really quickly here today. I, it's very rare I get the privilege of doing this, uh, but my parents are actually here today, my mom and dad. So could you just rise up to your feet just real quick and let them say hi to you? Awesome. So in case you wondered where I got my good looks from, you can wonder no more. And uh, they're both medical doctors and um, um, my dad's a doctor, my mom's a dentist. I, 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 had, I, I was raised by the NHS folks. <laughs> so... Um, and uh, my, my, my dad's an evangelist and my mom's a pastor as well. So, so they're, they're fixing teeth and preaching the gospel at the same time. Amen. So today I want to teach. Oh, and of course my gorgeous wife. Can I just celebrate her? Tamar Arayami. Hallelujah. I couldn't hear a word that she was saying today because I was fixated on her beauty. W wives everywhere are thumping their husbands going, why don't you say that to me? <laughs> so today I want to teach on um, a kingdom culture. A kingdom culture and what that begins to look like. And I got this message this morning, so I'm still in the training wheels of this message, trying it out and seeing what the Lord's saying. But the Lord spoke to me, and He said to me today, He wants me to teach on establishing a kingdom culture. And, you know, usually we get the opportunity to prophesy over certain ones of you and pray over certain ones of you. I'm probably going to reserve that to Prophetic Encounter Sunday next week where we'll get that opportunity. I want to lay a foundation today that when you come to Prophetic Encounter Sunday, there won't be a miracle you can't receive from God. I said I'll preach to the side that shouts the loudest. Oh, it's, it's kind of happening over here right now. So that there won't be a, a miracle that you cannot receive from God. But something I've learned from Jesus and from reading and following and watching Him all of these years, and I'll start with a story, a very, very true story that happened to me when I was just a 17-year-old boy. I was in a friend's house and we were sitting down and we were talking about Jesus. That's my favorite thing to do. I don't watch sports. Don't ask me about football. Don't ask me how many people are in uh, Manchester United. Tell me about Jesus and we can sit down and talk for hours, okay? And so we were in this living room talking about the Lord for hours. And all of a sudden as we're talking about Jesus, the power of God just strikes the two of us. We're both 17. We're both a little excited. We're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And we're just, we're preaching to each other like, I don't know if you've ever seen TBN where two people are getting happy off of each other and they're like, oh my God, preach that again. You know, that's, that's what we were doing in the living room. No camera. But we felt like, stretch your hands towards the camera and tell, you know, it was kind of like that. And all of a sudden, the power of God came upon the two of us, and we were out like a, like a lamp on the floor. I don't even know how long I was on the floor for. But I saw a vision, and I'll never forget this vision because it shaped the rest of my life forever. In this vision, I'm in the throne, I'm in a, in a sorry, in a, a huge banquet hall. And there's a table as far as the eye could see. I mean, it stretched. And on this table were multitudes of cultures. You had the Asians, you had the Africans, you had the Caucasians, you had the whatever your persuasions. Everybody 
was at this banquet. And we were all eating dinner and there was so much noise, so much celebration, so much jubilee. But I knew in this vision I was in heaven. Somehow I knew I was in heaven and I was at the supper of the Lamb. And I was looking for Jesus. Whilst people were like, pass me that piece of food or do this or do that, I was there looking for Jesus. I was like, excuse me. A butler came beside me, and the butler was dressed just like a, a butler would dress. You know, I said, excuse me, where's Jesus? And the butler looked at me, and he goes, oh, sorry, I've just got to get this food to this person. So I said to the person next to me, excuse me, where's Jesus? But they were so busy enjoying this meal that they wouldn't tell me where Jesus was. Then all of a sudden, I got a tap on my shoulder, and it was one of the butlers. And he said to me in this vision, he said, Tommy. You're looking for Jesus. I said, yes. He said, he's over there. And to my amazement, he points at the kitchen. And there is Jesus. He was there all along. He was the guy that was serving the food. And he looks at me and he says, Tommy, do you see what I'm doing? I said, I said, Jesus is serving me food. He said, go back and do that for my people. You can clap for Jesus if you want. That's up to you. But all, listen, all of a sudden I came back into my body, into myself, and there was a sense of awesome humility that came over me. I mean humility that you couldn't teach me in a Bible class. There's not enough Bible study that can teach me what I learned in that moment, in that vision where I saw the master serving food. And I didn't even recognize him because he was dressed just like the butlers. And I thought, my friend, when I opened my eyes, my friend was looking over me. He's a big guy. His name's Crispin, looking over me and smiling. He goes, what happened? And I looked up on the floor and I said, I saw Jesus dressed as a butler. <laughs> True story. And he was serving me food. And we sat down and my friend, we went back to our TBN place, you know, and we opened up the Bible to the, you know, have you ever been there where you just kind of flip a page? You know, when you're really looking for a word, come on, how many of you been there? Flip a page and go, oh, uh, and it says you're cursed, and you go, no, no, no. <laughs> yep. Okay. So I opened the Bible, I flipped a page, and the first page it came on to was the book of Matthew. I believe it's chapter 24, 28, where he's talking about the signs of the end times. And he says, right at the end of it, it just, it was the first thing my eyes went to. It says, to he who overcomes and is victorious, I will grant him to sit at my supper and I myself will serve him. I didn't even know it was in the Bible. I mean, you think we were excited before. Forget, forget TBN. I mean, we had a TBN, God TV and Revelation all up in there. And we were having a praise break. But in that moment of encounter, I learned more about kingdom culture than you could ever sit down and tell me about Christ. I learned more about Jesus in that one visitation that has forever eternalized me to the point that you can't sit down and teach me for years. You can teach me in the best theology schools, humility, but that one encounter of seeing the master of the universe serving me, it changed the rest of my life forever. I was forever ruined for the ordinary. All of a sudden, I realized what the scripture meant when it said, Jesus, seeing that he had all power over the devil. How many of you want to finish that sentence? Do you know what I would finish it with? And Jesus, seeing he had all power of the devil, went to South End Hospital and raised all the dead to life. 
That's what I would put there. And Jesus, seeing he had all power over the devil, decided to walk in the air. Why walk on water when you can walk in the air? Come on. And Jesus, seeing he had all power over the devil, decided to swim and never come up for air another day in his life. That's what I would put there. But he says, in, I would put in Jesus, seeing he had all power over the devil, walked into the cemetery and just said, rise. Ah, and every gravestone rises. But you know what it says? And Jesus, seeing he had all power over the devil, washed the disciples' feet. What is that? What is that? Stooped down and washed feet. And listen, it's not like the cute foot washing we do in church today. You know the cute one, the ceremonial one where the keyboard is playing nice and pretty and the, the preacher's there with his nice little cloak and his nice little cloth and he's looking all humble washing your feet. I'm talking about a day where you didn't have Nike shoes. I'm talking about a day where you would walk and donkey poo would be under your sandals and in between your toes. Foot washing was the lowest service job in any house. And he looked at Peter and Peter said, why are you washing my feet? He said, do you see what I'm doing? A servant is no greater than his master. If I can do this, you need to do it too. All of a sudden in that moment, that one vision, I learned more about kingdom culture than anything I've ever learned in my life. And it's from that day that I decided that I was never, ever, ever going to allow myself to become, to go from being a man of God to being a God of men. Because when you have an encounter with God like that, you cannot go back. You just can't. It's not about mastering. It's about serving. The amen sound really pretty. I hope they stay this pretty because I started with the good news deliberately. Because now I'm going to, I want to go into something that I believe is so crucial for the time we're living in. Yesterday, I, I was doing a prophetic training school in central London, and uh, we had a full house just like today. I mean, I mean, give yourself a round of applause. My God. You're on a, you're on a bank holiday weekend and we, we're, we're all in the back saying we've got no more chairs left. So if anybody else walks in, we don't know. They, you might have to put somebody on your lap today. Hey, it's about service, amen. Look your neighbor say, you can, no, don't say that. Anyway. So, so I was... I was yesterday doing prophetic training in central London, had a powerful time. All of a sudden, I decided I was going to go to the toilet. And when I went to the toilet, there was this man. And I walk into the toilet, and he looks at me. And the moment I walk in, he goes, sorry. And I go, sorry. And we kind of just went, and I used the toilet, and I went out. And the Lord looked at me, and he said, tell me, what was that? You know, when the Lord stops you in the middle of something, he said, what was that? Here I am, and I'm apologizing, and I haven't even done anything but walk into the toilet. Has anybody ever apologized for something you didn't even do? All of a sudden, I caught myself, and this guy didn't catch himself because he does it naturally. He looks at me. He's using the toilet. I just walk into a public toilet. And he apologized for his presence in the toilet. And I apologize for my presence in the toilet. <laughs> Me and this guy have a moment where we both decide to apologize for somehow seemingly making one another uncomfortable. And I haven't even started using the toilet yet. And I wondered, I said, God, what is that? And the Lord said, son, that is the culture. Mm. The Lord said, that is the culture. 
You know the book of Romans chapter 12? It says, be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I, I looked at that scripture after apologizing to that guy yesterday, and I realized it is possible to become so conformed to a way of being that it becomes your social norm. Can I tell you another social norm? Most women will never know this social norm. Sandy, they'll never know. Sandy's my new best friend, by the way. Sandy is my guy. Every morning, 5 a.m., we wake up and we pray, and he prays with me. I mean, he's there 4.30. I mean, before everybody else, he shows up. How many want to be there for 5 a.m. prayer? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, amen, amen. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll cast out the lying spirit later. Anyway, <laughs> so here I am. Where was I? Ladies will never know this. It's called the, the, we men silently call it the splash zone. How many brothers know what I'm talking about? It's when you go into the toilet, you're in your cubicle, our brothers know what I'm talking about, and then some other guy comes and uses the cubicle right next to you. It is a silent rule, ladies. It's silent. We never speak about it. That's why most men aren't speaking about it right now. But you use this cubicle. The person who comes in needs to leave a gap and use that cubicle. Because if they use this cubicle, they're breaking the splash zone. It's a real thing, ladies. We never talk about it, but it happens. We men have an agreement, don't we? We walk into the cubicle, we kind of look at each other like this and we go... But is it possible that there are so many unwritten laws that we have begun to live our life by that nobody told us we needed to live by, but we've accepted them as the norm, and much of them aren't even biblical? I said I hope the amen stay as nice. But I decided I was going to write down the nine top things British people apologize for. We Brits were masters of apologizing. I mean, I realized after apologizing to that person yesterday, I was like, oh, I'm apologizing. I'm apologizing for my presence. What is that? So I decided I was going to write down what are the nine things we apologize for? Are you ready? Are you ready? Number one, mistaking someone for someone else. How many of you have been there? I mean, that's kind of okay. You mistake somebody from someone else. I'm sorry, I thought you were somebody else. My mistake. You know, you walk into a shop. How many of you have ever walked into a shop and mistaken somebody for the servant, for the, per the employee? You know, excuse me, can you, can you put that on aisle two? I don't want it anymore. And they're like... How many of you have ever done that? I've done it in Matalan so many times. Like, excuse me, I don't want this anymore. And they're like... <laughs> you know, and then you apologize. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I thought you, I thought you actually worked here because, because your dress sense obviously tells me you look like somebody who doesn't know how to dress well. So I, I assume, oh, I'm sorry. I'm insulting you now. Can I, can I walk away? You know? Come on. Are you guys being real today? You guys are looking at me like I'm crazy, like you've never been there. So we apologize. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Here's another thing we apologize for. Apologizing for someone else speaking too quietly for you to hear them. You know, my wife does this all the time. You know, she, she, we're driving. She's like, what? Sorry? I'm so Sorry, say that again. Sorry, what? What are you saying? I'm so sorry. I need to apologize for not being able to hear you. Do you know, my, my parents 
took us to Florida. And when we were in Florida, here I am walking, right? And this guy, as I'm walking to the gym, this guy comes past me and goes, Good morning! <laughs> you know, I said, Man, that man almost assaulted me. <laughs> so I carried on walking. And somebody else jogging by said, Good morning, how are you? <laughs> What's going on? And then we walked outside our hotel and someone said, did you sleep well? I said, why do you want to know how I slept? <laughs> Strange person. <laughs> then I went to the gym, right? And I was rowing on the gym, you know, rowing. Yeah, I'm rowing on the gym. And this guy comes in, he goes, hey man, how you doing? I'm looking around like, who is he talking to? Is his, is his uncle here or something? Hey, I said, he said, no, you. I said, yeah, yeah, hi, how are you? He goes, oh, you from, you from Britain? I said, <laughs> I said, yes. And he goes, oh, would you like some tea? <laughs> and I was like, not particularly. And then, <laughs> Bishop Gathoni's enjoying this. Okay, so then he said, would you like some tea? And I said, no, not really. And then he said, he said, oh, I'm from America. We get up in everybody's business. <laughs> and I was so upset. I was meant to be in the gym for half an hour, but I went home in two minutes because this guy said hi to me. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You know, if somebody comes to you in this country and they say hi to you, you think something's wrong with them. Are you mentally unstable? You know? If somebody's on the train and they're smiling, you think, yep, mentally ill, yep. <laughs> Come on, can I get a witness? You don't want to talk to a smiling person because they have two friends, right? Invisible friends. Get away from me. Ah, hey. <laughs> Apologizing for someone else speaking too quietly for you to hear them. Here's a good one. Apologizing for someone else having a bad journey. <laughs> Can I just tell you something, folks? I have been here, okay? I was on a plane. I think I was on my way to Oklahoma, and there is this guy. And you know, Oklahomans, Americans, they like their cheese and stuff. So this guy was a, he was a, you know, big guy. And so he sits right next to me, and he's sitting there like this. And I'm like this the whole flight. And you're like, you're on a like a four-hour flight, uh, six-hour, sorry, flight, sitting there like this. And then, to add injury to insult, the guy goes... <sighs> I got to America, people were like, How, how's your trip? And I was like, it was terrible. And I was waiting for them to apologize. I was waiting for them to say, oh, I'm so sorry you had such a bad journey. Here, let's have some tea and talk about it. <laughs> but you know what they said? <laughs> oh, that's Oklahoma for you, man. They're crazy like that. I was meant to be there for two weeks and I wanted to go home already just because somebody didn't apologize for the fact that I had a bad journey. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. Apologizing for telling someone they're wrong. <laughs> Wives everywhere are like, yep, yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you're wrong. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. Why are you sorry if they're wrong? I don't know. It's just my culture tells me I have to apologize for being right. Here's another one. Apologizing for someone else bumping into you. Here's another one. <laughs> apologizing for bad weather. Another one. This is my favorite one. 
apologizing for asking if the most glaringly loneliest seat in the building is taken. I mean, it's lonely, nobody else is sitting there, but you feel the need to say, I'm sorry, is this seat taken? Why are you sorry for asking me if a seat is taken? Nobody's sitting there. It's not even my seat. Why are you apologizing to me? I don't know. It's just my culture. Here's another one. (laughs) Apologizing for bothering someone before you've even bothered to bother them. Somebody called the office the other day and they called me and they said, hey, Pastor Tommy, I'm sorry to bother you. I was like, huh? You haven't even bothered me yet. You haven't even bothered to bother me and you're apologizing for bothering me that you haven't even begun to bother me. I am sorry to bother you. I'm not going to take much of your time. But we're apologizing for bothering people. My favorite one is this last one. I mean, you know we're messed up when we're apologizing for apologizing. Apologizing for apologizing. A a recent survey of more than 1,000 Brits found that the average British person says sorry around eight times a day. And that one in eight people apologize up to 20 times a day. In the YouGov survey, 36% of British respondents said they would apologize for someone else's clumsiness. In one study by the Harvard Business School, Alison Wood Brooks and her colleague recruited a male actor to approach 65 strangers at a U.S. train station on a rainy day and asked to borrow their telephone. In half the cases, the stranger proceeded with their request when they said, sorry about the rain. When he did this, 47% of strangers gave him their mobile phone, compared to only 9% when he simply asked to borrow their phone. (laughs) Further experiments confirmed it was the apology about the weather that mattered, not the politeness of the opening sentence. Do you know what's so interesting about sorry and our British culture? Is that the only time we don't say it (laughs) is when we actually need to say it. (laughs) Another thing that is true to the British culture is chewing. You know, Britain is the Q capital of Europe. Let's move on to this next slide because of time. This is the next thing I decided to do in my time with God. I decided to write down five deeply un-British biblical miracles. Five, I I didn't even know what to call this message today, so you guys can name it whatever you want, but I called it establishing a kingdom culture. Five deeply un-British biblical miracles. Look at this first one. Shouting. 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 Do you you know that we Brits are so stoic that we don't like to shout? See? See right now what's happening? Mm Mm-hmm. You know, when, when... I have the privilege of preaching in so many different places. I love what I do. I mean, this is my job. It's my passion. And so when I I go, I realize when I go to America, for instance, and I preach, I just have to say, even if I say, Mary built an ark and Noah gave birth to Jesus, you'll see that keyboard go, and somebody go, hallelujah, yay! And somebody's wig will fall off. And then they'll run around the building. Hallelujah. I mean, crazy. 
it's crazy. Service just begun. You just started your introduction. And they stand up. You see, you see Sister Shaniqua going, mm. <laughs> Preacher, 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 preacher. <laughs> then the other week, I was, in, I was in Hungary, Budapest. And I was preaching. And I was teaching. And Hungarians kind of do this. Hungarians have two movements. <laughs> Just two. That is their Pentecostal. Imagine prophesying over Hungarian. My God. I mean, I was prophesying over this Hungarian and and it felt like, I mean, I was, I was reading his mail. I mean, the Lord was doing that. Oh, and the Lord says this, and the Lord says that, and the Lord says about your children this, and this, and this. And, you know, when you tell that to somebody else, like, ah, thank you, Jesus, Jesus, yes. You tell this guy, he's like. <laughs> and the translator's going, guru, 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 guru. he's like, da, da. I don't even know what they're saying. And he said, so he's like, and then the translator goes, he said it was very good. <laughs> Lord have mercy. And then you go to, then I preach in African churches. I, you know, go to a, a nice little redeemed church, you know? Come on, come on. And you preach in a redeemed church. And everyone's like, and you're preaching, and everyone corporately goes, Amen! Yes. <laughs> God's going to bless you. Amen! In the name of Jesus! And, And they rise up with so much vehemence and force. When it's time to pray, they say, pray, pray, pray. Magaskita zakata, keskede, ila patata, keskede, in the name of Jesus. And then I go to, then I go to a nice, I was invited one time to the nice little Church of England church. Yeah, how did I get in? I know, I know. But I got in, and they asked me to come and teach. And they warned me. They said, listen, we don't do all that, you know. I was like, okay. I don't know what that is, but okay. He said, we don't, we don't move, you know, so don't do this. Don't do that. And he said, don't, you know, he's giving me rules. Don't prophesy. Don't, I know you do all that where you come from, but we don't do that here. So here I am. I'm in this church. Hey, I've heard it all. Trust me, folks. So here I am. I'm in this church, and... And I'm teaching. And I'm teaching good. You know, I'm teaching as good as I can, but as calm as I can. You know, I'm trying not to be excited. So I'm like, I'm trying not to make too many movements. So I'm like, if you turn in your Bibles to the book of, and I'm trying my best, because Paul said to the Jews, I became a Jew. So to, so to these Church of England people, I'm trying to become as one of them, you know, just trying to teach and be nice and pretty and, and airy fairy and nice. And, and then all of a sudden, as I'm teaching, I get to a really good part that usually when I, I know when I'm at that part, it's, it's power. The presence of God falls and glory falls. But then as I get, you know, you know what I'm talking about, Pastor Keith, when you know that there's that meat that you're waiting to get to in your message, you know, and you get to that part, and then they go, hmm. Because, <laughs> you know, British people don't say amen unless you ask them to. We say, hmm. Mmm, 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 very good, very good, yes, yes. Oh, yes, very good, yes. But all of this is culture. 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 And you know, culture for centuries has divided us. Look around this room right now and see what God is doing. 
culture is being broken so that kingdom culture can come in. So it says, Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus' disciples, together with a large uh, crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus! Son of David! Have mercy on me! And here comes that tradition. In our church, we don't shout like that. In our church, we have three movements. Change the light bulbs worship. Simba worship. Cradle the baby, cradle the baby. Anything more is too, it's too, um, it's too radical. You know, I had one person come to me, he goes, oh, they go, oh, oh, tell me, tell me, do you go to one of those? I said, I said, what? He goes, do you go to one of those churches, you know? I was like, what, what is this? What do, you, what do you mean? He said, he said, do you go, you know, to one of those sister act churches? I was like, oh, you, oh, happy day. That's what it is. But notice, somebody needs a miracle. And to get a miracle, you've got to break your tradition. Because anytime you try and stay in your culture, Your culture can ruin what God is trying to do. Which is why he said, those that come to me need to realize that there's no Greek, there's no Jew, there's no barbarian, there's no Nigerian, there's no African, there's no Jamaican, there's no Asian. We are all one in Christ Jesus. You know, when I married my wife, I married my best friend. But you know, when a Nigerian marries a Jamaican, My Nigerian culture speaks. Her Jamaican culture speaks. And what I don't realize is every time I'm arguing with her, I'm arguing based on my culture. And every time she argued with me, she was arguing based on her culture. And so here I am going, where is my water? Why are you still in bed? Are you not in the kitchen? And then she come with her Jamaican British self. You mess with me, me go back to my yard. She doesn't even need to say anything. All she does is this thing. Let me show you how to speak Jamaican. Are you ready? I just taught you Jamaican. 
in one second, I told you to. <laughs> so we decided one day, I raised the white flag, and she raised the white flag, and we said, cease fire. And we sat down and we said, listen, I can't bring my culture into this marriage. And she said, I can't bring my culture into this marriage. I said, so let's create, since we're a new person, let's create a new culture. You have to understand. You see, the church will come together in unity when we stop trying to get each other to be each other. When we just come together and say, listen, we are one new man in Christ. We got to figure out what our new culture is. Amen? Is this blessing somebody? So this man's shouting. What's he doing? He's breaking the culture. He got a miracle by breaking tradition. Number two. You know, I picked this picture. Are you ready, Scott? I picked this picture because my mom loves Mrs. Bouquet. She, <laughs> this was her guilty pleasure as a kid. It will be gold TV and it will be Mrs. Bouquet. Bouquet, darling! Oh my gosh, that woman drove me mad. <laughs> Number two, skipping the queue. Skipping the queue. Oh, we British people love to queue. Do you know somebody's actually set up a business because they've realized people like to queue? So they will line up outside the Apple store for you. You pay them to queue. I mean, talk about a business plan. And they get money to queue for you to go away, and they'll, they'll hold the queue for you. One day, I was at McDonald's, and there were three queues. So what do I do? Everybody's lined up in one queue, and then they break at the front into three. I said, this is crazy. So I just went into the shortest queue I could find. And this person looked at me like I stole their baby. <laughs> and she's telling her husband, can't he see, can't he see there's a queue? Can't Philip, can't he see there's a queue? Can't he see it? We're all here waiting in this queue for a blooming 10 minutes and he just comes in here and he has the audacity to go stand there. Tell him, tell him, Phil, tell him. <laughs> I mean, the obsession with queuing. But look what happens here in this scripture. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I touch just his clothes, I'll be made whole. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was free from suffering. At once Jesus realized and he said, who touched me? Paul said, Peter said, everybody's touching you, for there's a great crowd here. What did this woman do to get her miracle? She skipped the queue. You can't get a breakthrough trying to be traditional. If you want a breakthrough, you've got to break the culture. Number three, I've got to be quick now, entering uninvited. Have you ever had somebody come to your house that you didn't even invite? And listen, I tell you, as the most pastoral person you probably ever meet, if you came to my house and I didn't invite you, I will slide down the sofa in slow, slithering motion, and I will lean against the window so when the doorbell rings... <laughs> Do 
But look what happens in Mark 10, 46. Since they could not get him to get to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof. Come on. They couldn't get in through the front door. So instead of going home and saying, you know what, we'll come back next week or we'll catch it on television later. (laughs) They decided that they were going to make a door in the roof of somebody else's house. Imagine you're having a nice home Bible study. Just, let's just paint a picture. You're all in your living room, you're drinking tea and cookies and all the things, and you're talking about Jesus wept and all of the scriptures that you love, for God so loved the world. And all of a sudden, a piece of scaffolding falls <laughs> into your tea. Bloop. And you look and you go... So all of a sudden, (laughs) after saying sorry, (laughs) you look up and you grab somebody's chocolate. And they go, What? What? I'm missing. There's a man in the sky. And then your neighbor goes, yeah, yeah, I know. You're seeing visions. God bless your little heart. No, really, really. There's a crazy guy in a stretcher with four other crazy people, and they're breaking a hole in your house. And they're they're lowering this body down into the living room. And everybody's like, whoa. And Jesus goes, (laughs) whoa, hallelujah. And they look, I go, what's wrong? Jesus goes, wow. Do you know what it said? Jesus marveled at their faith. Do you know what I would have marveled at? Their vandalism. (laughs) But what did they do? They broke the culture. Hey, don't show up at my house when I'm sleeping and let me look up. (laughs) And then, and then see you dragging yourself down and saying, but you told me to break the culture. <laughs> I will call the police, okay? <laughs> Number four. Arriving late to your best friend. Come on, think about this. Here comes Jesus. His friends come to him and go, Lazarus, Jesus, your best friend, Lazarus, is dead. And he goes, okay, I've got to preach. They come back later and they go, Jesus, your best friend, Lazarus, is deader. (laughs) And Jesus goes, okay, I've got to preach. Jesus, your best friend Lazarus is dead assed. And then Jesus goes, take me to him. Because the tradition said, Jewish tradition said, after three days, a body had no longer even been in the earth anymore. It was now said to be in heaven or hell. So Jesus waited until after the third day to show up to a funeral. And they come and they said, if you had been here sooner. And he said, listen, you know me by tradition, but you don't know me by reality. So the reason I showed up late, because I was trying to teach you that this thing is not unto death but it is to set a new opinion of God. And there Jesus, again, raised the dead. And this is a good one. 
Number five, asking a man crippled for 38 years, do you want to get better? <laughs> My dad's a doctor. I don't know if I can ask you this question. If you went to one of your patients who was born crippled and was 38 now and they're still crippled, and you said, do you actually want to get better? What would happen? <laughs> I'm just asking, because what would happen? Would they be struck off? Is that, is, that, is that reasonable? But here's Jesus. Watch this. Watch this. Let me, let me paint this picture, because my time is up, so I'm going to swim this home now. A man was sitting at a pool for 38 years. Think about this. 38 years sitting at the same pool. The Bible says the pool he was sitting at was called Bethesda. Bethesda means the house of grace. It had five porches, five being the number of grace. But in the place of grace lay a great multitude of lame, sick, Halt and withering people waiting for the moving of the waters. For they believed that an angel would come and whoever stepped in when the waters were stirred would be healed. So this man is sitting in the house of grace, but in the same house of grace, there are people living in sickness, bondage, depression, and anxiety. Might I put to you in this closing final few minutes of this message that you can be sitting in the house of grace for years and still never have met the God of the grace. You can be going to the house of God for 38 years and never have you met the God of the house. You can be sitting in church, going there because it's traditional and because your auntie went there and your great auntie went there and you don't want to break tradition and you're sitting in a house of grace. But you're still sick. You're still in debt. You're still in bondage. Your situation isn't matching your revelation. This man sitting here for 38 years. I began to study this man. I was fascinated by him. Because tradition had taught him to stay in a place that Jesus recognized that he had been in too long. Is it possible that the only thing keeping you from your miracle is your culture? Here's this man. He's sitting at this same place, studying this same pool. How many years does it take to get a degree? Three years. This man has been studying the same pool for 38 years. He ought to have a poolology degree. <laughs> but he's looking at the same pool. 38 years. Going to church. 38 years. Praying in tongues. 38 years. Reading your Bible. 38 years, but your tradition is keeping you from the very grace that is available to you. And Jesus steps in to hit the play button because this man has been on pause for too long. And when Jesus shows up to this man, 
He says the only way to amend him is to offend him. And he says he contradicts political correctness to ask this man, do you actually want to get better? And I believe in that moment, folks, Jesus wasn't trying to be mean. I believe he was looking at grace. He was looking at Bethesda. And then he was looking at the cripple. And he said, you mean you have all this opportunity and you're still lame? He said, do you want to get better? And look what he did. In a moment when God asks you, do you want to get better? He decides to talk about what made him bitter. Oh, you don't understand how hard it's been for me. Oh, my daddy left me here when I, was a, when I was a child. I was abandoned all my life. Nobody gets me. Nobody understands me. Nobody's there to help me into the pool. Listen, I stepped myself, I inserted myself into the story one day, and I said to myself, if this man actually wanted to get better, he's crippled. He's not going anywhere. He can just stay in the pool. Oh, come on. So when the angel comes, he's already there. I mean, he's not going anywhere. He's clearly got nothing better to do with himself. So just stay in the pool. In a moment, I got it. This man didn't want to get better. Is it possible that many of us don't actually want to get better? We just want to have enough people feel sorry for us. We don't want counseling to get better. We want counseling because we want somebody to hear how painful it's been. We want counseling because we're afraid of failing so much that we would rather stay in slavery than believe in success. We are medicated by our pain. What made Hebrew slaves long for slavery when God promised success? The fear of failing. They would rather stay in tradition where they're comfortable than move into the new. But in order to get something you've never got, you've got to be willing to do something that you've never done. Everybody that got a miracle from God broke the mold. I was in a meeting one day, and this woman came. The, her, her brother bought her. Uh, Sasha, are you ready? I was in a meeting. Her brother, her brother called her up, and he said, Hey, he said, Tommy, I, I need you to pray for my, uh, my uh, I can't remember if it's an auntie or whatever. And he said, uh, She's got arthritis, and listen, it's bad. So when I saw this woman, she came to me, and it was in Northampton, I'll never forget it. The woman looks at me, and she goes, listen, before you pray for me, just know, Benny Hinn's prayed for me. <laughs> Reinhard Bunke's prayed for me. <laughs> Tommy Tenney's prayed for me. And I still haven't been healed. You know what I said? I'm not going to pray for you. And she looked at me and she was like, what? I said, I said, listen, I don't want to be on a list <laughs> of all the folks who have prayed for you. And then you go to the next person and go, Benny Him, pray for me. Tommy Tenney, pray for me. And even that guy, Tommy, pray for me. Nothing happened. So what makes you? I said, I don't want to be on that list. I don't really want to be on that list. And I said, and I said this, I said, I said, listen. This is what I said. This may offend somebody, but this is what I said. I said, listen, do you get benefits? And 
And she looked at me, she goes, yes. I said, what would happen if you got better? She said, I'd have to come off of benefits. Is it possible that there are benefits to staying where you are? That many of you don't want to let go of the tradition. You just want to complain about it because there are benefits that come with staying where you are. There are benefits. Listen, the reason why many of your husbands I'm going to mess with this don't want to get saved is because it means they actually have to start going to church and praying and living right. But listen, brothers, you ought to have been doing that anyway because you are the priest of this home. You are the leader of your house. She's waiting for you to step up. Enough of this just woman being in church and not their husbands. It's time for men to arise. I said it's time for men to arise. He's sitting at the pool. And Jesus said, I realize that if you get better, you're going to have to stop begging. You're going to have to get a job. Is it possible your tradition is keeping you where you are? And nobody's holding you back but you? Because listen, what is faith? Faith is anything that breaks the culture. You can't get a miracle doing the same thing. You can't get a miracle doing the same thing. You've got to break the culture. Rise to your feet. Do you know why I'm passionate about this? Because next week, Sunday, when we do Prophetic Encounter, not next week, the week after, when we do Prophetic Encounter Sunday, I want to see your life get blasted by God. But if you're going to stay in your chair when God is moving next the week after next, He's moving right now. But if you're going to stay in your chair and stay in tradition, you might miss the best thing that you ever got in your life. Because let me tell you something, the world is getting Jesus without getting Jesus. Do you know what I'm saying? There was a Greek woman who couldn't get her child to be delivered from a demon. She came to Jesus and said, Jesus, have mercy on my child. And Jesus ignored her. And then she worshipped and Jesus turned around and said, it's not right for me to give the children food to a dog. Why did he call her a dog? Because she was not a Jew and Jesus only came for the Jews. He said, go not to the world, rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And here comes this Greek woman trying to tap into what belongs to the children. There are people in the world tapping into what belongs to you. How did she do this? I'm glad you asked. This woman said to Jesus, yes, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the children's table that the children don't want. Think about this. Don't let the world do more with crumbs than you and I do who have the entire loaf. Don't let the world get the crumbs 
And you who have the bread can't get healed, can't get delivered, can't get set free, can't get prosperous, can't break into your new season, can't receive breakthrough. The world is getting healed from crumbs. They're getting blessed from crumbs. They're prospering from crumbs. Meanwhile, the church who has the whole loaf is taking it for granted. And I realized what this woman meant. She said it's possible that the church can get so familiar with the loaf, which is Jesus, that when he walks in, they just give him the same praise they gave him last week. The same offering they gave him last week. The same worship they gave him last week. The same prayer they gave him last week. It's time to go after God with everything on the inside of you. Do you know that song when you walk into the room? We're going to sing that song. And I want you to rededicate everything on the inside of you back to the Lord right now. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to lay hands. Just grab hands with the person next to you right now. Put your hand on their shoulder. Everybody put your hand on their shoulder right now. We're going to do this together. Look at them and say, I love you. I love you by force and you don't have a choice. I just want you to pray in the spirit. Everybody just lift up your voice. Pray. Pray until you feel tradition being broken. Pray until you feel racial divides coming down. Pray until you feel unity coming into your soul. Pray for your neighbor like you're praying for yourself. Pray that God would break down the walls that have divided us. For the Bible says your tradition has rendered the word of God ineffective. We break tradition today. We break the mold today. We're breaking it today. We're tired of tradition. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Just real quick, let's stretch our hands towards this man here. It's King James. Is that right? That's his name, by the way. King James. My God, stretch your hands towards King James. And King James, I just hear the Spirit of God say, the Lord says, Son, in this season, I am shifting and I am shaking the house, says the Lord. And the Lord says, Son, you went through a season that went through almost like a Saul and David encounter where the Lord says, I shook you free from denominational constraints. For the Lord says, you were not a man that was willing to partner with a political and a religious spirit. So the Lord says, Son, I brought you through a season of forced change that I might cause my glory to even shine upon you in a greater way. And the Spirit of God says, Son, in this season, I do not call forth just for the pastor. I call forth for the pioneer, says the Lord. For the Lord says, Son, the way you are going, you have not been this way before. So the Lord says, Son, others have tried to offer you tools and ways to build. But the Lord says, I am giving you new materials to build with in this season. And the Spirit of God says, I am making your hand like the ready-handed writer. And the Lord says, Son, part of what I'm producing on the inside of you is, the Lord says, I am bringing forth 
the minister and the businessman at the same time, says the Spirit of God. And the Lord says, son, it will not be either or. It will not be just church or ministry. For the Lord says, I place a leadership anointing upon your life that wants to see leaders raised and men discipled. And so the Spirit of God says, I want to baptize you with fresh fire and a fresh release for a new vision, says the Spirit of God. And the Lord says, son, you will come into a time where you will see that that which you are contending with was just contending with the mantle that I have placed even upon your life. And the Lord says, son, I'm taking what the enemy meant for frustration and I'm turning it into years of joy. And the Spirit of God says, I am re-anointing you, rededicating you, and recommissioning you. And the Lord says, there will come a time where the Lord says, all those who tried to bring you down, the Spirit of God says, they will see you in your elevated place and they will glorify me, says the Spirit of God. For the Lord says, I still remember the books that I have laid up in your spirit to write. I still remember it, says the Spirit of God. And the Lord says, I am birthing it now, says the Lord, that even those half-done projects will find their place of completion in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I want you just real quick, just everybody close your eyes. Hey, listen, if you're here in this room today and you don't know Jesus, but you've heard this message, or maybe you did know Jesus, but you fell off a little bit and now you're trying now to rededicate your heart back to him. Listen, the Bible says your traditions have rendered the word of God ineffective. Shake off the traditional clothing today. Shake off the clothing that says a man does this and a man does that. Shake it off today. Don't let tradition hold you back from an encounter with Jesus Christ. If you're in this room today and you're saying, I want Jesus to come into my heart. I want him to come into my life. I want him to transform me. I just want you to lift your hand right now. Let me see you. I see that hand. Let me see you. I see that hand. Let me see you. If you're here today, let me see that hand. You're saying, I want Jesus. I want to dedicate my life to him. Let me see those hands. I see that hand. Don't let tradition hold you back. Lift that hand up high so I can see it. Lift it up high so I can see it. I see that hand. I see that hand. If you're here and you're making that prayer, listen. The Bible says, if you are ashamed of me before men, I will be ashamed of you before my Father is in heaven. Listen, I need all of those hands who I can see. Come out of your chair and meet me at this altar right now. Just come on out. Just come on out. Don't be afraid. Clap for them as they come. Just come on out. Just come on out. Just come on out. Just come on out. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Come on, clap for them. Come on, clap for them. Clap for them. Heaven is rejoicing right now. Hallelujah. Come on, they're coming. Keep clapping. They're coming. Listen. Hallelujah. Glory. Can we pray with them? Anybody who's around them, just put your hands on their shoulders right now. Let's do this together. You know, the Bible says if any man or any woman believe in their heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and confess with their mouth that God has raised him from the dead you will be saved 
That's all you have to do. Just repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus. Say, Lord Jesus. I come to you in need of your grace. Father, I believe in your Son, Jesus Christ. I, can, I believe it with all my heart today. And I confess with my mouth that God has raised Him from the dead. Say, Lord, be my Savior. Be my Redeemer. Wash me in Your blood today. Give me Your peace. I receive you into my heart. Say, Satan, I renounce your rights over me. Amen. Amen. I have a new master, and his name is Jesus Christ. And this day, I declare I am born again. Amen. In the name of Jesus. somebody tell me you love them god bless you thank you for coming today to my church we have had a phenomenal time glory to god go and serve the lord amen sickness starts to vanish every hopeless situation ceases to exist when you walk into the room the dead begin to rise because there is resurrection life in all you 